who's this crazy guy, you know? And I realized later on who he was, but I didn't know when I was younger. I knew who Miles Davis was, I knew who Wayne was, I knew who Ellis Marcellus, the whole Marcellus yeah. family. Um, but George, Dr. George Allen was the one that basically had, he was the gatekeeper yeah. <laughs> for us to meet all of these great musicians. So Wayne Marcellus selected 30 musicians from different cities um, to play in the Duke Ellington Youth Orchestra. And so he asked that I would play drums, he asked that Christopher McBride would play uh, bass. And uh, Joey DeFrancesco played piano with us for a little while, but then Miles Davis took him in his band. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. we were like, okay, bye Joey. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, so we traveled around, we did a bunch of dates um, as that group. We played at Berkeley College of Music. Mm -hmm. By the end of that performance, they had already been writing up um, scholarships for all of us to come to the school after we left high school. So basically, we just walked into a situation. We, um, some of us went to Juilliard, mm -hmm. and um, the other half of us went to Berkeley. Awesome, that's great. Um, how was that experience of being uh, in that community also, Berkeley and Juilliard? Oh, Berkeley was amazing. Um, and it's not just because of the school, it was because of the students that were there too. Um, I know Holden went to the five-week program not too long ago, and he got a chance to see, you know, other students that are awesome, you know, like him. You know, interact with them, learn from people from Columbia, you know, people from Japan. Like, we would all just hang out and, like, play stuff together. And, you know, they'd ask me, can you play this for me? Show me how to play this. And I said, can you show me how to play that? You know, so we were learning from each other outside of the classroom. So that was the biggest thing about Boston. Of course, the jazz scene was huge there too. So I'm hanging out with Roy Haynes and Tommy Campbell. And you know, I used to work the door for Tommy Campbell, you know, when I wasn't at school. And just watching him from the door was my drum lesson. I never had a chance to sit with him. He'd say, Yeah, I'll get with you, man, I'll get with you. He was so busy, I understood. But just for me being at the door and watching him play from a distance was my drum lesson. Yeah, that's great. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your exposure to jazz music and, and starting playing jazz as a drummer. How was that like? And, like did you transition slowly from like, playing church into jazz? Uh, how was that like? Great question. Um, jazz and gospel music is so close, you know, mm -hmm. closely tied spiritually as well. Um, so it was an easy transition for me, but you know, I was sitting behind watching Jeff Tank Watts every night <laughs> and watching Hurl and Riley play drums with Wynton. You know, like every time Wynton came in town, he hit me up, get over here, come hang out. You know, I hung out with them from sound check till the show time. And I sat backstage and, you know, he'd have a chair right behind the drum set and I'd just sit there and watch, you know. And that, like I said, that was my lesson. I never had a, a formal lesson with Dennis Chambers or Jeff Tain Watts or Harlan Raleigh, I never really had a formal lesson like I do with some of the kids now. Um, I didn't get to sit with them for an hour and, and just pick their brain. But like after the show was over, they would show me a, a quick rhythm or you know, a New Orleans beat that Harlan Raleigh played or whatever. And that was my lesson, I had to pick up quick. We didn't have the, the uh, technology that they have now. We didn't have YouTube and all these videos that we could slow down and reverse and rewind, you know, forward. No, we had to listen to the records or we had to go see them live. I had to go see Tony Williams live to see what he was doing or Elvin Jones, yeah. which I'm glad I got a chance to see all of them play when I was younger, Art Blakey, you know, so that was our schooling. Yeah, that's great. I, I saw, uh, you know, well, I've been seeing some, some uh, videos of your lessons with the really young cats and uh, you show them the, uh, the funky drummer, right, beat. Tell us why it, that is so relevant, the funky drummer, and like maybe explain to our audience like that might not be aware of what the funky drummer is. Yeah. Um, Who doesn't know what the funky drummer is in here? Okay, that's cool, that's cool. But you've heard it, and you, I wish I could play it, and then, then they'd be like, oh, okay, I know what that is. So it's James Brown's drummer, uh, Clyde Stubblefield, uh, and Jabo Starks, who was and two drummers at the same time we had in the band. Um, but this one particular beat, because basically, I'll let you know that those drummers were what hip-hop sampled 
for their hip hop beats. Most of those hip hop beats were sampled from James Brown's recordings and then his drummers. The, 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 the break beats that would happen when the band would cut out. That was Clyde Stubblefield. Yep. And that's the funky drummer beat. Um, but yeah, I make it a point to teach every student that comes in my room that beat. You know, eventually, I mean, we'll go through a bunch of other stuff. Ethan, we've, we've played a lot of different styles of music. Um, Holden, we've went through a lot of stuff. Holden, amazing, you know. He doesn't need me anymore, so that's why I haven't seen him in a while. <laughs> but that's what I do. My students, once they get to a certain level and they're good, I don't say that they're good enough or too good, but for me, I feel like I've already shown them what they needed to know, and then I kick yeah. them off the nest. <laughs> I'm like, plant the seeds. Yeah, and yeah. I let them go and, and explore for themselves, because that's the other part of the education is finding your own voice. Yeah. You know. And talking about education and, and the jazz language, uh, it was when I went to college. Uh, I remember they, uh, my teachers, they wanted us to all study jazz and move into the jazz world. And at the time, I wasn't really into jazz. I mean, I, I listened to some jazz, but I was very passionate about rock music. And uh, but later on, I started discovering jazz and going really in, into it, and uh, start uh, just studying the language. And then I realized, oh, now I understand why they were so um, persistent in like teaching me all this jazz, right. because it opens the doors to so many things. And I guess for you. Uh, maybe gave you the tools to then transition into the pop world. Absolutely. I mean, if you can play jazz, I really feel like you can play anything. You know, that's like the Bible of music to me. Um, somebody could debate me and say, no, that's not, I don't believe that. But for me, I really think that jazz is uh, Ojita. <laughs> Ojita Penn, amazing keyboard player. Um, but yeah, you, if, you play, if you can play jazz, the vocabulary is so, intellectual for one thing and you know if you can play that stuff it's not jazz isn't easy it's an improvisational form of music but you gotta go through a lot of different things to learn how to get to that point where you can just improvise and not think about it yeah. you know you have to have technique you have to be able to connect with the spirit world you know and a lot of other music isn't as hard to, to do you know pop music is, is you know, pretty basic and it's, has its form, but you got to have these other techniques to be able to get to that level to play those things. And I think like also jazz, especially when it comes to improvisational music, uh, one of the things it teaches you is uh, how to have a dialogue, a, a conversation with your peers. And there's like these uh, uh, democratic participation, right? Uh, have you... What would you say or what would you recommend for people that is, uh, they go to jam sessions, you know, to learn uh, how to play and how to improvise? Uh, what would you recommend as far as um, the ego that sometimes, you know, gets in the way when you're playing with other people, uh, especially when there's a live audience around you? It's not just about you. You know, the biggest part of it is being able to connect with five to ten other individuals on stage. You know, and you got to do it simultaneously. You know, I got to be able to connect with Ojeda. I got to be able to connect with the bass player, the horn player, the vocalist. A lot of musicians don't know how to back a vocalist. You know, you might be playing too loud. You know, you might not be able to accompany them the right way. You know, you got to, you have to support the soloists. You know, um, drummers like, you know, you have to know what volumes to play. You know, if, even if it's mic'd, or if it's not mic that's even a better way to do it. I learned at a young age that um, if I couldn't hear the bass, the upright bass, or the piano you know, with no micing, I'm too loud. You know, they were like, play softer so you can hear what they're doing. <laughs> and that, that's, they, that's uh, you certainly have to develop that skill, especially as a drummer. It's very easy to play loud. Right. But to control the instrument. That's the hardest can, part. Still play fast, but it's in a, in a control, low volume. That's hard. Absolutely, it takes time. Yeah, that's that's mastery right there. When yeah. you can, when you can mix yourself, we say, you know, uh, if we were, if you had a 
this right here, <laughs> and you're manually mixing your volume, yeah. you know, by the way that you play. Okay, so you are 23 years old, and you're starting to play with. Not now. No, no, no. <laughs> I just went back. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just had a birthday last Monday. I'm yeah. 47 now. <laughs> At some point in your life, you were 23 years old, and uh, and you got a really cool gig with Janet Jackson. How how was that? And how that came to be? Okay, so yeah, um, my reputation started getting really good in the music business at a young age. So by the time I had left Berkeley in uh, 94, and then I moved here, um, I didn't even know nothing about Atlanta actually before I came here. It just really just kind of happened, it was kind of divine. Um, moved here, met, well before I moved here, I came and, and, and played a few shows here. And that's what really attracted me to the city in the 90s, because Atlanta was really, really doing some things. You know, a lot of up and coming stuff. LaFace Records was here, TLC, Usher, you know, a lot of stuff. Uh, John, Johnny O'Neill was here, OG the Pen, a bunch of amazing jazz musicians were here. Um, I, and I would, would hang out when I came here just to see what was happening in the city, because I was used to that in Philly. Go to the jazz clubs, go to Ort Leeds, go see Mickey Roker and all these cats play. That was a norm for me, going to Boston, seeing Roy Haynes and Pat Metheny and all these other people play. That was a norm. So when I came to Atlanta, I was like, let me see what Atlanta's offering, you know, what they got going on in the city. So I got a chance to see a lot of the local stuff that was happening. I saw some uh, voice that needed to be filled that I knew I could fill, you know, this band right here. Yeah. The Chronicle. <laughs> That's why I formed that band when I moved here. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, man, there's something missing that I know I can add to the city, which we started a movement with that. But, um, the transition was meeting Jim Jermaine Dupree, Dallas Austin, meeting the guys from Organized Noise, and working with some of those guys. Right before I got here, you know, I hooked up with those guys, and my first gig, like biggest tour thing, was with Escape, and that was through Jermaine Dupree. And so things just started just adding up from one thing to the next. So my reputation started really getting bigger, and. Uh, so many musicians that were from here, or that are still from here, Sonny Emery, you know, amazing drummer for Earth, Wind & Fire. He, we became friends meeting him in Philly before I, you know, went to Berkeley. So we stayed in touch, and when I moved here, I hung out with him, played at his clinic and all. He let everybody know, this is new cat in town, little John, you know. I went up and played at his clinic. And um, so him, Sam Sims, amazing bass player, um, those guys, basically started talking about me as well in the industry. So when it came town time for Janet to uh, switch drummers, Jonathan Moffat was playing yeah. there. He's Michael Jackson and yeah. a bunch of George Michael, uh, amazing drummer. He had to move on, and as soon as they needed a new drummer, they told her about me. Did and you have to audition, or it was like? I didn't have to audition. Um, it was a trust thing, for sure. Um, I know they did some research to see me playing, they saw videos and things of me. And, um, but it was a big, big trust for me because there could have been a whole bunch of other famous drummers that could have done that gig before. Do you think it was your shops or it was also like your work ethic that they knew about? Both, well? yeah. yeah. Uh, I had prepared myself, I was ready. And it's funny because I had already been thinking about, man, I wanna play with Janet Jackson one day. You know, and I just kept putting that out there, and of course, that's an example of your words being powerful. Yeah, right. You know, manifesting things in your life. And a lot of the things that I've done, I've, I know that I've manifested it, you know, of course, through God as well, but I thought about those things, I meditated on them, not really knowing what meditation was at that age, but I just put it in the universe, like, man, I wanna play with him, I wanna play with her, one day I wanna play with Michael Jackson, one day I wanna play with Prince, Man, I would love to play with Stevie Wonder. Whew, that would be awesome if I played with Stevie Wonder. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but the the time came for me to, you know, show what I had in rehearsal, no audition. So she didn't really know what she was getting like in person. She saw like the videos and things. So I came to rehearsal, I had already learned the whole tour, uh, the tour show, you know, basically. They sent me 
a DAT. We had a DAT players back then. Yeah. So they sent me a DAT of one of the shows, and they sent me a video so I could see what was going on. You know, because I'm coming in a few weeks before we had to go to Australia mm -hmm. to do the second. How much time did you have to prepare? We had four weeks, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I, it was the Janet tour yeah. in '95. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I listened to over and over every day, watched the video, I knew every drum, uh, every dance movement, everything, and where the drums should play. So I came in and they said, well, what song would you like to go over first? You know, and I said, we can do the whole show if you want. <laughs> Which they were very impressed by, so we counted it off. I had never used in years before, I never heard how to play to pre-recorded tracks and stuff. So that was a lesson for me right on the spot. I'm like they put my in-ears in and I'm like, I hear the click going. So you know that's my guide to count people the band in and everybody else in the production. So this was a lesson for me on the spot on a major tour. But you you prepare for this for a long time. So yeah, yeah. I was already yeah. ready. Yeah. Did yeah. you feel uh, any any pressure, or you felt like really confident? I'm no, really at ease, man. Yeah. Like I, I mean, I, it didn't dawn on me the multitude of this situation until we got to the first show in Australia, and I see all the production, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this is for real, you know. And uh, so the first night of the show, you know, I, of course I had jitters and everything, but I was already prepared for it. So I was like, let's go. Yeah. And then I mean, we, you play with. So many, so many great artists. You're a great artist yourself. And uh, I went to see Stevie a few years ago. I think it was Phil Serena, and you were there uh, uh, on the tour of uh, Songs in the Key of Life. And that was a phenomenal, phenomenal concert. I was amazing yeah, experience. Was amazing experience. I've known about Stevie's music since I was a, a little boy. My, my dad plays harmonica, and so he would, you know, like listen to. Uh, STV and also to the Steel Smiths, that, that's another giant. And uh, but I've never seen him live. And uh, thanks to well, uh, shout out to uh, Ruby in the Spirit, they uh, took me over there and um, to see this concert. What a beautiful, what a beautiful experience. Stevie was the most fun to work with. He's a jokester. We have a lot of fun, and he's an amazing, of course, musician. Keyboard player, but also an amazing drummer. Amazing drummer, yes. And um, that can be a little intimidating, if not a lot, you know? And because he hears everything you're doing, every single thing he hears, you know, blind people have that sense, of course, when yeah. not seeing it, but hearing everything. Yeah. So he turns around, he's smiling, you know, while we're playing and stuff. Like, and, I, and I realized, like, he likes me. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to accomplish when I'm playing. 